Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Elizabeth von Hassel, the Executive Director of the National Sporting Library uh, and Museum here in Middleburg, Virginia. I wanted to thank everyone for joining the Piedmont Environmental Council and the NSLM tonight for Gems of the Piedmont. It's a great pleasure uh, to partner with the PEC, and I consider myself very lucky to have such a long-standing relationship with this organization and also with many of the people involved that are doing such great work uh, here in the Piedmont. As you can see, uh, here I am in the middle with uh, Chris Miller, who's president of the PEC, many of you know. Uh, also, Kat Imhoff, who is a PEC senior fellow. This was not too long ago. We were all together on the Rose River. Uh, I'd like to pretend like we were doing some research uh, for the talk this evening, which we were, but we were also having a great day fishing. The NSLM is the only publicly accessible museum and special collection library which is dedicated to the preservation and protection and education of traditional field and turf sports. And obviously that's gonna include uh, angling, of course, but wing shooting and uh, equestrian sports. We're very much committed uh, to educating and advocating for the conservation of landscape, open space and waterways, and all of these uh, most necessary for these sports to continue. We make our home here in the Piedmont and take pride in being part of a community that works collaboratively on protecting the land, protecting the waterways um, that not only sustain us, but provide the canvas for all the many outdoor activities that uh, we all enjoy. So being able to partner with our friends at the PEC um, allows us really to share and celebrating our resources, also to advocate for the beautiful land and waterways which are around us. So you can actually see that our missions are very closely tied. Um, at the NSLM, we tell the story of preservation and conservation. And we do this through art, um, sporting, ephemera, literature, um, and through a really a broad range of educational programs and partnerships. And we'll put up a couple of slides here just uh, in terms of some of my very favorite paintings from our permanent collection um, by landscape and wildlife artist Frank Weston Benson and Ogden Minton Pleisner. Um, for our angler and rare book enthusiasts, we house over 2,000 angling books. Uh, this is uh, right here, we're looking at the complete angler and Isaac Walton. We have the, one of the largest collections, actually uh, 90 editions of the complete angler, angler. We also have a very amazing collection of hand-tied flies. So I'd like to invite you all at any time to please come see us um, and, and I'd be happy to show you around and give you a tour of our collections. Many of our members and our community are avid anglers. Um, we do understand the importance of preservation, uh, pre uh, preserving our landscape. Also, obviously, as you see here in our waterways, a healthy brook trout population, it's really a very strong indicator of a healthy environment and a sustainable um, and also a very responsible sport practices. Tonight, we're so pleased to partner with PEC uh, to celebrate the really great work this organization has been doing in the area of conservation of the Piedmont and specifically of brook trout. Um, at the end of the program, we're going to randomly um, be drawing two names, um, which we will then be sending you in the mail, a, a very carefully uh, selected um, a group of flies that will really take care of uh, anyone who wants to fish on the rivers of the Piedmont. So, so, um, so happy you all could join us. I'm just delighted to introduce my great friend, colleague of 30 plus years, I hate to say the number of years, she's my hiking, riding, hunting, angling friend, um, Kat Emhoff, and let me turn it over to you. Welcome, Kat, so happy. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and I'm holding up the very special case filled with beautiful flies that will go to some lucky person. Um, anyway, it is such a joy to be co-hosting this event, and it's really clear as two nonprofits working in Virginia that we love nature and wild things and are dedicated to preserving our forests, fields, streams, and rivers. I also really love the fact that the mission in the National Sporting Library and Museum specifically mentions preserving, promoting, and sharing the literature, art, and culture of angling. But before we can talk about our charismatic fish, for those of you who may not be familiar with PEC, we are, of course, a nine county community supported and locally focused nonprofit dedicated to protecting the natural resources, rural economy, history and beauty of Virginia's Piedmont. And next year we will be 50 years young and look forward to celebrating with many of you. And there is much to celebrate, um, but as you're gonna hear, there's still much to do. Now PEC has a vision of a million acres and we're gonna be talking about brookies, but they're never far from our minds that in order to have 
clear and clean trout filled waters, you have to have healthy forests and unfragmented lands. And so a lot of you also know PEC for our work with landowners on permanently protecting the places we love. And our long-term goal is to conserve a million acres of land or 50% of the rural area in our region. And remarkably, we are over halfway there. And this map represents the private land protected in perpetuity by conservation easements in the dark green, as well as shows some of the public land such as Shenandoah National Park. So over half a million acres, very exciting. And saving those lands leads directly to the why we care about water and trout. As you probably know, we do sit within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So the work that we're doing to protect our local waterways also is very much part of this larger effort to protect the bay. And that work includes everything from trying to reduce impervious services through land conservation and land use planning, planting riparian buffers, recognizing scenic values, and oh yeah, restoring the stream's connections to improve trout habitat. Which brings us to this remarkable fish. As some of you know, I used to work for the Nature Conservancy in Montana, and there we were really dedicated to saving grizzly bears along the Rocky Mountain front. And the grizzly bear was our indicator species, meaning that if grizzlies did well, and a whole host of other species, plants and animals also did well. Or maybe to put it another way, the grizzly was our canary in the coal mine. Well, brook trout is our indicator species here in the Piedmont. When trout do well, the waters we love and need do well as well. I'm now about to turn this program over to Celia, who used to be PEC's Habitat and Stewardship Specialist. I'll let you tell her about her great new role. But I would note that if you do have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Elizabeth will be moderating at the end of the presentation. Celia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kat, for that great introduction. And of course, thanks to the National Sporting Library Museum for inviting us and giving PEC this opportunity to talk about our trout restoration work. Um, as Kat mentioned, I'm a PEC's Wildlife Habitat and Stewardship Specialist. I've um, been working with PEC for seven years, but um, sad to say that this is going to be my last speaking engagement with PEC. Um, I was offered a position as the private lands biologist for the Northeast, for Northeastern Virginia with Quail Forever in partnership with NRCS. So I'm going to be providing technical advice to landowners interested in managing their property for grassland birds, birds like bobwhite quail, pollinators, and other wildlife. So I thought I'd like to, to start off with a little background about Eastern brook trout as a species. The brookie is a highly sought after game fish and is thought to be one of the most beautiful freshwater fish on the East Coast. There are also the only trout that's native to the Eastern United States and in our neck of the woods, native adult brookies average about only six inches in length, which is pretty small when compared to adult rainbow or brown trout, for example. Brook trout are an important species for conservation and PEC because they are an indicator for water quality. They need cold, clean water to survive and therefore indicate if there is ideal habitat and stream conditions. In our region, they are now only found in headwater mountain streams that flow out of Shenandoah National Park. Humans have a long and storied relationship with brook trout that begins with trout as an important food source for early Americans. Many Native American tribes that called the lands along the East Coast home were excellent fishermen and have stories centered around this fish that are an important part of their culture. They utilized a variety of fishing techniques, like for instance, a bag net made of bark or twine that was suspended from a hoop that they could catch the fish in the water. And also some tribes use small hooks made from crab apple thorns to catch trout. You'll notice the large photo here of a weir on my slide, which is basically an underwater dam on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. This photo is from a recent fascinating article by the Bay Journal that shared research involving the cataloging of these weirs that were constructed by Native Americans to catch American eels as they migrated up the Susquehanna River. American eels live side by side with brook trout, are also imperiled and benefit from our restoration work. American Indians also fish for eel and these weirs are likely over 6,000 years old. That means that they are older than the Great Pyramids. 
We know that this is the Mon Monacan's homeland, but Virginia's first written history about brook trout dates back to the early 1700s with the first European settlers who found a vast wealth of natural resources in the New World. This excerpt is from John Fontaine's 1716 journal, and he talks about fishing in what is now the Shenandoah River. Brook trout were an important part of some of the earliest settlers' diets, like it was for Native Americans. Moving forward in history to the 1920s, we find that mountain families and communities that lived in and around what is now known as Shenandoah National Park relied on brook trout as part of a subsistence diet. These are excerpts that were taken from the Shenandoah National Park oral history collection that's housed at JMU Special Collections. These oral histories captured mountain life and in many of them, fishing for trout is fondly remembered. As life changed in the Blue Ridge, trout fishing became less about subsistence and more about recreation. Here we see photos of President Hoover fishing at Rapidan Camp in the early 1930s. Today, many remnant trout streams are actively sought after by fly fishermen from around the country, and the people who live next to them still speak fondly of their connections and memories of trout. In fact, this spring, the Department of Wildlife Resources posted a write-up on eight trout stream destinations in Virginia that are some of the best of the best in our state. DWR highlighted the trout streams that are in and around Shenandoah National Park that PEC has been doing our conservation work on as one of the eight, specifically the Rose and Rapidan Rivers, the North Fork of the Mormons, White Oak Canyon Run, and the Hughes River. They even offered some fishing advice in their blog. And um, I think if you Google this, you can probably easily find this blog post to learn more. So today, headwater, tr headwater trout streams that support the last surviving native brook trout populations look pretty much like this. This is an example of a classic Blue Ridge trout stream taken in Rappahannock County at one of our project sites, Bolton Branch. Headwater streams in our region are characterized as small, sometimes only six feet wide or less, very rocky, dynamic, fast moving with riffles, pools, and logs and tree roots that provide protection. And most importantly, are surrounded by mature forests. Here's a breakdown of all those habitat features to really give you an idea of how dynamic these stream systems are. Let's start with the rocky or cobble bottom, which is where brook trout lay their eggs. And I'm sure a lot of you know that the best spots to cast your lines would likely be in the pool over there to the right or near what we call in-stream cover, where mature trout like to hang out and hide. The riffles or fast moving water that flow over the rocks kind of work like a bug conveyor belt and brings hungry trout waiting in the pools with dinner. And last but not least, you'll notice the dense forest canopy that helps to shade the stream, keep it cool, and provide leaf litter for the stream bugs. So our long and storied connection with the eastern brook trout in Virginia is being threatened, however, from a couple of different sources. Land use change due to unsustainable farming practices and development has historically been the main driver of eastern brook trout decline, along with the building of roads and dams, which block migration and movement of the species. Additionally, introduced game species like brown trout and some invasive species as well can predate on young brookies, which can suppress their populations. Climate change effects and water acidification are also a problem in our region. PEC's Trout Stream Restoration Program is focused on addressing these threats by improving fish passage by removing barriers to movement and improving water quality and resilience to climate change by restoring habitat. This is a map of the eastern brook trout's current range in the northeast. The red areas represent locations where trout populations have been greatly reduced. Yellow shows reduction at a lesser scale and gray means that they've been extirpated. The green, which is unfortunately the smallest amount of color on this map, are the native brook trout strongholds. In this purple oval, you'll see PEC's region, which has some trout strongholds, which you'll see in green, but it also has experienced extirpation and population losses. All of this together adds up to restoration opportunities to protect what we have left and restore what we have lost. Here's an even closer look at our region's trout streams. On the map on the left, you can see the spine of Shenandoah National Park in dark green on the left side of the oval, which abuts Rappahannock, Madison, Green, and Albemarle counties, which hosts the trout streams on private lands that flow 
out of the park. BC's conservation work with these county counties communities over the last 50 years has uniquely positioned us as leaders and innovators, which has allowed us to carry this initiative forward. We believe that the successful restoration of the of this species rests in the cooperation of private landowners, the Virginia Department of Transportation, PEC, and our partners all working together. This is Trout Unlimited's river conservation strategy of protect, reconnect, restore, and I've applied it to our region. The protected area represents Shenandoah National Park and associated private easements. Reconnect demonstrates our current fish passage population, fish passage restoration area, and restore shows the work that PEC does to protect farmland and restore degraded riparian buffers for water quality further downstream. Reconnecting streams to each other to allow aquatic organisms like the brook trout and American eel to access more habitat is key to restoring the species. This is very important. This diagram shows how road stream crossings, which include culverts, fords, and bridges, can impact aquatic species' ability to move between stream reaches. For brook trout, it is incredibly important to the survival of their populations to be able to move from a stream system in, to another in order to access maybe ideal spawning areas, search for more food, disperse genetics, and escape environmental events and impacts like droughts and land use changes. Road stream crossings create barriers to movement or fish passage by preventing a fish from moving easily through its structure due to a couple of different physical factors. Culverts or pipes that sit several inches above the water surface make it difficult for any fish to jump up into it unless they are an adult brook trout. Even then, if the culvert is elevated greater than a foot off the surface, like the one shown in this photo, an adult brook trout cannot jump high enough. Also, undersized crossings that pinch the stream, as well as shallow water crossings that create conditions where water flow is either too fast or the level is too low for a fish to cross it, create passage problems. Many times, road stream crossings that are acting as barriers have two or all three of these issues, plus some more. I like to say that what's bad for fish is usually bad for the landowner. Crossings that are creating barriers for fish tend to either be aging or falling apart, or were just not sized correctly for the stream channel and create flooding issues for the landowner. Fish-friendly crossings that are designed using a technique called stream simulation design, which takes into account the characteristics and the flow of the natural stream channel have been shown to be more resilient to storm events. This photo shows a fish-friendly crossing from Connecticut and the arrow is pointing to a rock that stayed in place despite flooding from Hurricane Irene in 2010. This means that the stream bed was able to retain its physical characteristics and handle extreme flooding thanks to a properly sized crossing. Oh, sorry about that. So our trout stream restoration project began with a survey of road crossings in 2014. With funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we surveyed 133 crossings, which spanned four counties. This was actually my first project at PEC, and I personally surveyed, along with an intern, all of these crossings. It was quite an adventure. We used the River and Stream Continuity Project Volunteer Protocol, which is utilized widely across the East Coast. We focused on designated class one and two trout streams in Rappahannock, Madison, and Green, and a little bit of Albemarle for our survey. By assessing passage on only the highest quality trout streams, we're ensuring that our work would conserve imperiled populations that already existed. I wanna point out too, that about 58% of the road stream crossings we surveyed are owned by the Virginia Department of Transportation or VDOT, while the rest are private. This means that our restoration work requires two different strategies and resources. Since the completion of the survey, which told us that which shows what property owners were most interested in addressing barriers out of all the restoration activities, PEC has built and broadened our trout stream restoration initiative. We took the data from our 2014 survey and we found out that, as I mentioned, only about half were private and the other were owned by VDOT. And it also told us which ones were causing issues for passage for trout. 
We prioritized those sites into our first project list and chose two pilot projects, one on Spruce Pine Branch in Rappahannock and the other on the Robinson River in Madison County, both were privately owned. Since then, we have worked with Toronto Limited to replace a crossing at the popular White Oak Canyon Trail at Shenandoah National Park, which some of you may be familiar with, and just wrapped up our largest restoration project to date at Bolton Branch in Rappahannock County. We've also spearheaded an innovative partnership with VDOT that my colleague Claire Catlett is leading, which has produced two pilot projects on public roads in Rappahannock County. Claire will be talking more about those in a moment. While PC has been a leader in this initiative, we would not be able to do the work that we do without the support of our partners and funders. Stream restoration work is incredibly complex and these projects are expensive and have a lot of moving parts. We rely on the expertise of partner groups like US Fish and Wildlife Service, Toronto Limited, and the Department of Wildlife Resources, just to name a few, and the financial support of PEC's Krebser Fund, the Nimick Forbes Way Foundation, the Orstrom Foundation, and NIFWIF, among others. Lastly, Shenandoah National Park has been an ally of ours from the beginning because they understand that working outside of their boundaries benefits and protects the natural resources that they shepherd. I hope that I've impressed on you all the beauty and significance of the Eastern Brook Trout and the streams that it relies on, in hopes that you will stand with us as champions of this little but powerful fish. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Claire Catlett, for an overview of our restoration work and VDOT partnership. I'm gonna stop sharing. Go ahead, Claire. Okay, thank you so much, Celia. Well, welcome again, and I'm so glad to meet you all. I am Claire Catlett, and I work in Rappahannock and Fauquier counties as the land conservation field representative at the Piedmont Environmental Council. My background is in stream restoration projects. I worked out in the desert Southwest where there's just a little bit of water to play in sometimes. And now I get to play in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains, and uh, I'm really happy to share with you some of the work. So here we have a map that shows where exactly Celia and, and others have surveyed the 133 stream crossings. We actually ran a prioritization of these sites based on their important values for water quality and stream habitat. The top uh, ranked uh, projects here are the ones shown in dark red, which I'll probably point out with a laser. And we're gonna focus up here in Rappahannock County. There's some dark red up there. And there are a few others uh, down in Madison County too. Um, these again were uh, attributed to the, the worst of the worst as far as being barriers to fish passage, but also needing improvements for water quality. So here we, zoom in a little closer on those sites. Um, and we picked off the ones, most importantly, that we had uh, a really great landowner partnership for, the first four that we led. And so we did start at uh, Spruce Pine Branch and Robinson River, as Celia mentioned. And then we worked at Bolton Branch, uh, which I'll spend some time sharing about uh, that project in a minute in 2019. And we're back there again now uh, for a second wave uh, with the Virginia Department of Transportation. And we also have completed a project at White Oak Canyon in 2019. And that project also was in partnership with Trout Unlimited. What's next for us is our work uh, to complete these public road stream crossing pilot projects. And so we're calling it Bolton Branch 2, like I said, we're coming back, and Piney River. Both are in Rappahannock County. All right, so let's go up to Spruce Pine Branch first. Um, this is my first job practically at PEC and I was happy to do it. Uh, we had these three culverts underneath the driveway um, that were really restrictive on the street. And as you can see, um, these culverts are, you know, traditionally, you know, put in by landowners and they are, 
you know, simple, easy, do the job, but they do wear out easily and need to get replaced over time. So the landowner said, you know, I'd like to take these out and definitely do something better. So I'd like to credit the landowner, Jim Northrup, a friend of the Shenandoah National Park, you might remember. And uh, we worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service here. Um, and then we also worked to restore this stream and reconnect a little over a mile and a half upstream for Eastern brook trout and other important cold water species. The type of bridge we've put in here is called uh, a prefabricated you know, steel bridge. These are easy to install and take about two or three days um, max for construction. And that includes filling in the concrete footers, getting a crane in there and laying it down and setting it all up. So the next place we worked was at White Oak Canyon. And many of you have heard of this before. This is one of the most popular hiking trails of the Shenandoah National Park. We learned pretty early on that um, this was going to be a big project to help the park. And especially when it was 2020 and everybody at once was wanting to go into the park. Uh, so the results you'll see um, in just a minute, but you know, to lay out what was there before, here we have those failing crossings. Uh, or culverts, that was the main crossing. This is the main entrance into the Shenandoah National Park. And then I wanna point out what I call a trout cul-de-sac down below. So we did aquatic surveys here with the Department of Wildlife Resources. And what we found were all of the trout were stuck down here beneath these culverts and none of them were getting up into the park. And if there were any in the park, it was um, actually upstream of here, very full of cobble and rock. So not great habitat um, and not a lot of water upstream. So now, ta-da, big open crossing. We call this a bank full crossing because the whole bank of the stream, bank to bank, is open underneath this bridge structure. And so thanks again to the great leadership of Trout Unlimited and the National Park Service and a partnership uh, unique here was working with the local landowner, Jimmy Graves of Graves Mountain Lodge. And we we're able to track the success of this project going up and downstream to see that indeed the trout are moving now um, from downstream to upstream and, and back again if they should choose. So here we are again at Bolton Branch. And at Bolton Branch, we are uh, in Huntley, Virginia, and right up next to the National Park. This property is adjacent to the National Park. Uh, Bolton Branch is in Rappahannock County, and this is kind of the big picture, like I said, on the left side of the screen is the National Park. So we'll work our way down from the park here, which is going from upstream to downstream. This green square is the new bridge that we installed. The red square is the VDOT crossing that I'll talk about in a little bit as our Bolton Branch too. And then the red uh, outline here, this is the um, linear uh, restoration. We did about 800 feet of stream restoration and um, that was to uh, enhance habitat downstream to increase the, the amount of space that these trouts could, could roam. And so when we pulled out that crossing um, that Celia again had surveyed as one of the highest ranked barriers um, for trout passage and also, you know, a high priority for us as TEC to work on. Um, this is what we were dealing with. It's a concrete slab, low water ford with a single culvert pipe. Under. And we're able to replace it again with these great open span bridges and they provide, you know, open access for habitat and allow for the stream to freely flow. These are stream simulation designs and are great for people and fish. They provide flood resiliency and improve stream habitat. And we know this, again, we're doing that monitoring and we've seen the brook trout population counts go up 30% since we've completed this project with our before and after data. So what was there before um, for that stream restoration section I pointed out before? This was again, 800 feet we, we restored, which is a pretty good amount, I might add. Um, there's something called head cutting that happens on highly erosive streams. And so this is, you know, looks like a waterfall, but it's actually damaging the stream because loose uh, sediment is getting uh, pulled up into the stream bed and that sediment fills in the spaces between rocks that is important for trout to lay their eggs. It's also important for macroinvertebrates and other aquatic life. 
And finally, it reduces uh, the amount of oxygen in the water. So yes, all life can, can go down when there's a lot of sediment in the water. We also had to fill in this old stream channel, or I should say new stream channel. Um, we re-put the stream back in its, its you know, natural place, um, but the head cutting had led to um, the down cut of this channel in red here. So this is what it looks like after. So right, much better here. And we did restore this area with native plants and shrubs. And this picture is taken just one year after construction. Um, and there's at the top here, you can't quite see it, a big, beautiful pool um, that I call the trout jacuzzi. And when we do our fish surveys, that's where we find almost, you know, the most amount of trout anywhere on this section of Bolton Ranch. So let's talk about those monitoring results. Um, we count these fish um, for you know, abundance and diversity as well as aquatic passage. And we use a, a protocol that we've set up with the Dep uh, Department of Wildlife Resources and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We're comparing the before and after data and upstream and downstream. And this is really important to prove our project success and showing we're making a, a true difference for the brook trout. So a little fun stuff, um, you know, I always love this day, I call it Christmas day, um, because it's just the most fun you can have outside. And you find everything that you want to see out there. So the great American eel, and then other great cold water species pictured here. So again, I've been talking a lot about bringing back populations before and after restoration. Here's the quick kind of snapshot of what that looks like when you analyze all our data. So on the left, this is our before data. So as you go from upstream to downstream data, uh, our data is showing that the passage was decreasing and there is less species abundance uh, downstream. And then when we do our 2019 after surveys, it goes up. And how cool is that to get more abundance, more diversity, all good things uh, after we complete these restoration projects. So now I'm gonna talk about kind of the big picture here. You know, we've been working hand in hand with the Shenandoah National Park and the Department of Wildlife Resources to track the success of our restoration projects. But we know that the big picture is not looking great for brook trout. Um, they are in decline in the national park and all habitat in Virginia. And so we really want to show um, how we can help. Um, as Celia had pointed out before, you know, declines in brook trout, you know, are jeopardizing their continued existence. And it's changing the way we can even interact with them as a sport species. So what is happening? Why are the brook trout going away? Well, you might have guessed it, but you know, the weather just is not the way it used to be. And there's not as much water in the creeks um, sometimes, or there's way too much. And so these high impact storms and droughts are really um, the most important and dynamic factor that's uh, affecting habitat. So I'm gonna just, walk you through this real fast, but I've got some of those major storm events you might remember from 85, 96, 96, I think a lot of people remember. Um, and you can see the dips in population. These undulations are showing the combined monitoring efforts of the Shenandoah National Park and the Department of Wildlife Resources at one stream at White Oak Canyon. And then we get to the early 2010s and you really start to see droughts play a major role. And what I want to point out is the back-to-back -back drought and storm um, follow-up is what really is, is, is hurting the brook trout and other populations too. So again, just big picture, I'm uh, showing you here that, you know, we think a lot about climate change and flood risk as something that happens on the, the shorelines, the coastlines, but actually our mountain communities are really, really part of that. And um, in this new data, um, I, I really encourage you guys to check it out. Um, the flood risk in some of the counties of the Eastern Blue Ridge are showing how much uh, an impact we might have in the, the coming 20, 30 years. And this will change. Um, a lot of habitat, but also the way we live and are able to be in our mountain communities too. So that brings us to VDOT. Um, the real reason we can work with VDOT is because we can improve flood resiliency and public safety by paying attention to water quality and habitat at public roads. Um, so we're really lucky to have been able to, to sync up with our Virginia Department of Transportation. I think 
I think luck is the right word. Sometimes I pinch myself that we're still doing this. And it's amazing. Um, we're, we're rolling out two pilot projects the next year at Fulton Branch and Piney River, both again in Rappahannock County. And you can check them out. Um, they don't look great, right? Uh, you can see that the culvert at Fulton Branch is one of those perched culverts. And Piney River is, is structurally, you know, not looking great either. Um, a lot of the road is washing off. And uh, this project, uh, both of these projects, I should say, are due for maintenance anyway, which is how we were able to work with our local Culpeper district is to say, hey, if you're going to replace these, let's make them better. And when it's better, we can pass wildlife, floods, and traffic more safely. So back to Bolton Branch, I told you we're coming back. Bolton Branch too, here we are, that red square. That's where we're working with VDOT. And what is it gonna look like? Well, at Bolton Branch, we're actually gonna be doing larger culverts. Um, ideally though, it would be great to get one of these bottomless arch culverts in. This again is that full span of the bank, um, which is really awesome to, for all habitat and flood resiliency. Um, it also mimics, you know, or allows for the natural stream bread to, to be, you know, open and then it requires minimal maintenance. Um, with the, the bigger culverts that you can install, you know, the goal is to counter sink them. Um, and when I say that, I mean, if you can imagine this, this bottomless arch was actually a giant uh, ellipse and half of it was buried under the ground. That's what countersinking culvert is. When you can do that, again, you're allowing for the natural stream bed to be there and you're getting some of that spanning of the bank, which is really, really critical uh, for habitat and flood resiliency. All right, so I've been really, really pleased to share some of the work we've led for stream restoration here in Virginia's Piedmont. And just like this mama trout here that you can see, you know, we, we are ready to keep going um, and, and span into the next direction for our project. So I'm going to pass it back to Kat to tell you about our big plans. Thank you both, Claire and Celia. That was such a great and in, interesting presentation. Brook trout really are the gems of the Piedmont. And, and as we're hearing, there is a lot more to be done in our own backyard to improve trout habitat. Uh, before we, and, and some great questions have been coming in the chat, but before we go to the questions, I would just wanna wrap uh, this up by giving you a sense of scale of the work and the resources needed. So we know that there are over a hundred miles of trout streams in our region, and there are at least 70 crossings that need to be replaced. And parts of those streams also require habitat restoration. There are also at least 200 landowners that live along these trout streams and we need to be in contact with them. And of course, partnership with the state agency VDOT uh, needs continuous stewarding. And accelerating this restoration and this outreach work, it will, will help increase the rate of conservation. And it's very consistent to what you see as the priorities of the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, US Fish and Wildlife, and of course, Conserve Virginia. This is, however, as you could tell from Claire's uh, talk, not a small undertaking. It requires collaboration between landowners, PEC partners, state and federal agencies, and a philanthropic community that's really excited about our work. So we'd be glad to, very glad to follow up with any of you who wanna get more involved. And we've thrown a, a lot at you today, but we really wanna remind you that the goal is pretty simple by removing barriers and replacing them with very fish friendly designs, we can reconnect miles of stream and help brook trout not only thrive, but also give them a chance to move back into the streams where they historically have lived. So in any case, uh, if we forget, we're not only doing this because we love uh, trout, but we also, these waters uh, for many of us are also our drinking water supply. I'll look, there you go. And if you'll advance one more, Claire. This is um, a picture I just wanna spend a moment on. You know, these rivers provide us with these amazing places to connect with nature. And here's one of our board members enjoying a day on the Mormons River, which we've mentioned. 
And a friend of mine always says that if you should at least spend 20 minutes a day in nature, unless of course you're too busy, and then you should at least spend an hour. And I hope that all of you will have many hours standing in a stream that you love. And as I turn this program um, back over to Elizabeth for questions, I wanna thank her and all of you for making the time to be with us this evening. Conservation is something we participate in every day of our lives. And in the face of climate change, suburbanization, land conversion, I mean, I could go down this long list of challenges and threats. There is indeed a lot at stake and there's a lot at risk, but there's also an amazing opportunity to do so much good work here in the Piedmont and the trout with all of you. Elizabeth? Great, thank you so much, Kat and Claire and Celia, and, and thank you um, so much to the PEC. This has been um, absolutely wonderful program. Uh, we have asked um, everyone, if you had questions, to please um, write them in the chat room. So I have a few questions that I'm just going to relay and um, Claire or Celia, whoever would like to answer um, some very interesting ones. Hopefully we'll have time to get through most of them. Like to start with, who is the brook trout expert in Virginia? The expert. This is from Roger Kirby. I don't know if there is a particular expert. Um, luckily, we've actually have a lot of folks in Virginia that are very well versed on brook trout as a species and just trout, other trout species and fish, freshwater fish in general. Um, we work with Trout Unlimited, Seth Kaufman from Trout Unlimited is someone that um, we, we work with a lot, you know, rely on his expertise. Uh, there's a number of folks with the Department of Wildlife Resources as well. Um, we work with John Odenkirk, who's a fisheries biologist. Alan Weaver is the fish passage coordinator for the state. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably the other person that comes to mind as well is Lisa Moss, who's with the US Fish and Wildlife Service too. Great, thank you. Um, another interesting question, what are some strategies you use to convince private landowners um, to invest in better crossings? How are y'all making that happen? You wanna take that one, Claire? That's great. Well, some of them don't need a lot of convincing because they love the brook trout so much. And, and if we can just make sure we're very careful and, and generous towards their love for the brook trout, a lot of this, this is made possible. Um, and, and that's not, not a, a humble answer. I really do think that that is something you have to maintain as part of the core value of why you're doing this work. Um, secondly, you know, we are working with uh, grant partners and, and, and private funders to help make this happen. And that helps offset the cost um, for landowners. And I think that definitely makes a big difference if you are able to assist and, and do some cost sharing on these projects with landowners. Um, finally, you know, it's it's technical assistance. They're going to learn a lot about their stream that they might have not already known. And also we're going to do those surveys, which is really fun for a landowner to learn about the, the health of their stream over time. And also they're always welcome to join us for our fish surveys too. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Claire. If all the crossings were improved, how many miles of streams um, would you estimate would be reconnected? I think... <laughs> This is not an exact number. Um, it could be somewhat, somewhere like around 100 miles, give or take, um, and which is pretty significant if you think about it, um, to have that much um, stream connectivity a span, you know, a four county region um, would be pretty big. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any signs at White Oak to let all the hikers know about the new crossing and its benefits? Not yet. So we are um, working with Shenandoah National Park on putting in an interpretive sign. So that's a little bit in their ballpark, um, but we do plan on putting something up there to let people know about the restoration work. There is a little sign on the bridge. I mean, and I shouldn't say a little sign. It's a very nice sign that, yes. that says it's a stream restoration project by Piedmont Environmental Council, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Nimick Forbes Way, Trout Unlimited, all of that. Is, is right up there. So um, do you wanna say, if you walk that, that path, you will run into that sign, hopefully. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, how did PEC find and determine which locations to restore? 
So that is based on the um, crossing survey that, that I did in 2014, where I went and surveyed basically all the road stream crossings that I had access to, both private and public. And then we went from there. Can brook trout thrive in cool water ponds or must they be in a stream to survive? I'm gonna think it, it would, it would probably be unlikely, uh, Celia can chime in, but they really need um, a lot of oxygen and they, they love the riffles. Um, they're gonna be in the pools right after a riffle. Um, it's hard to get a pond to have that much oxygen. I, I'm not sure if it would work. That being said, there are, um, you know, sport fish that are the sterile trout, brook trout species that might be more adaptable to ponds mm -hmm. um, versus wild brook trout. Okay, that's interesting. Um, why was there a decrease in brook trout um, during the third and fourth monitoring periods at Bolton Branch after the restoration? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the theory is if, if you build it, they will come, um, but sometimes they, they stay where they were because they still like it. <laughs> but yeah. what we really wanted to know was are other fish that, that are, are succeeding just as much. And we also are doing macro invertebrate monitoring there, which is really cool to see that the, the macros are really um, coming in and thriving and we're getting um, pelgrimites and mayflies and all the good stuff. Um, so, you know, if the food is there and the habitat's there, we, we hope that over time, those brook chat will, will come back too. Okay. Thank you. Well, and, and another question regarding Bolton Branch, just looking, um, what, uh, or why did you decide to do culverts at Bolton Branch and not an arch? Yeah, I'll go back to, to that. I think I, I might've rushed through that a little bit, but um, the uh, Department of Transportation has, you know, their own way of doing business. Um, and when they do maintenance projects, they really want to keep something called a hydraulically equivalent structure. Um, and that, that means we, we can't open up the stream bank greater than a certain amount. I mean, the magic number is 36 square feet, technically. But if you open it up too much, then it becomes a bridge. And when we're looking at restoring some of these projects with the transportation folks, um, we have to kind of walk that line with them and see how far they're willing to go with opening these crossings. Um, and also, it, you know, it's a money issue. Um, bigger structures cost more money. So mm -hmm. when we can do properly, um, count, properly countersunk culverts that are sized appropriately um, at Bolton Branch, it will span over 50% of the stream's um, natural channel width. So that's actually a sizable difference. Right now, I think this, this span is like 5%. Um, so we're gonna make a big difference. It's just not the full bank width. Um, but you know, it, it's little by little. And we want these, um, I'll, I'll say one more thing, the VDOT projects to be replicable. And then really um, important thing is if we can do these maintenance projects, low budget, efficient, and something that they feel comfortable doing, then they're happy. it might happen that it'll, it'll be done again. And that's what we really want. Great. Well, thank you, Claire. We have time for a couple more questions, and then we, um, um, I've, I've asked uh, Valerie to, to do the drawing, so we will let uh, two of our, our lucky participants know who are going to be getting the wonderful flies that have been selected specifically for fishing our wonderful streams here in the Piedmont. Um, so another interesting question, have there been any studies on cost savings and safety benefits from fish passage projects? projects like these based on their capacity to prevent flooding and damage to infrastructure? Not as many as we would like. Um, there is a study that is widely referenced out of Connecticut that looked at um, sort of the, the damage that was incurred to a lot of road stream crossings in the state following, I believe it was Hurricane Irene in 2010, 2011. And I mean, basically the state had to replace a lot of road stream crossings as a result of that hurricane. Um, and they used stream simulation design. So they were really thinking about putting in crossings that were appropriately designed to handle flooding events, which are also tend to be fish friendly crossings as well. So there's a mutually beneficial thing. And what they find is that um, when you put in these uh, you know, fish friendly crossings using stream simulation design, the amount of money that DOTs and the landowners have to spend on upkeep drops dramatically. So there is that initial investment of they're putting in a crossing that might be a little bit more than they normally would spend, but then it 
comes back to them over time because they're not having to repair it and replace it if it gets blown out during these big storm events. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's been some other studies out west, but um, you know, there's we just don't see enough of that research um, happening. So we're you know we're hoping that we'll see more because it's really valuable with. Um, being able to prove what we know, you know, to um, the public, to other state agencies, to VDOT, you know, et cetera, so. Thank you. Um, another interesting question, if any of you are actually, you know, lucky to, enough to live where you have some wonderful streams going through your property, I think this is an excellent question. Um, so if you own a section of mountain stream with a population of brook trout, are there any best practices the landowner should know uh, to look after the trout and to protect them? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, the easiest thing is shade. Uh, shade is, is gonna give you cool water and trees are gonna bring bugs. Um, and that's like steps one and two. Uh, step three would be check out any barriers to their movement. Is there a driveway near you or your driveway? Um, do you have an eroding stream bank that might be adding sediment to the stream? Um, and again, you know, trees will help. If your stream bank is eroding, planting trees along it will, will help uh, hold that soil back and stabilize your stream bank. Um, I think I'll, I'll just stop there because honestly, trees are the easiest thing you could do and, and the best thing you could do. Great, thank you, Claire. Um, and a, a last question before we let you know who our lucky winners are. Um, are there any volunteer ways that people can get involved with brook trout? Always, you know, um, stay in touch with PEC. I, I always include volunteers in, in the trout surveys if they're wanting to come out and do some electric fishing with me. Uh, and also, if you're really into things, we can look at the data together and try and figure out what's going on. Um, but uh, there's opportunities for tree plantings also in these headwater streams through PEC and the Friends of Rapid Mechanics Headwater Stream Initiative. We just wrapped up a really awesome spring planting season with 20,000 new trees here in the Piedmont. Um, so to be continued, we'll be rolling out um, a big program of tree planting this fall. Great, well, thank you. Um... Wanted to go ahead and, and wrap things up and let uh, everyone know. Kat, are you are you available to hold up this wonderful box of flies? Um, I so am. There they are. As Kat said to me earlier, curated specifically, not just created um, for our, for our fishermen and anglers uh, uh, on our beautiful waterways in the Piedmont. So our two lucky winners, and we will um, make sure that we have your um, information, but the first winner is Betty Adams. So congratulations to Betty Adams and also Roger Kirby. So those are our, our two winners um, for this evening. So congratulations. Um, just a couple of things as we wrap things up. Sincerely, thank you so much. It's been wonderful partnering with the PEC. Claire and Celia, it's just been great working with you. Kat, always a pleasure to work with you. I know Chris Miller's online and a few few you know names that I recognize. George Orstrom is on. Glad you could all join many friends of mine. Um, just a couple of last things to point out. Uh, we are also at the NSLM currently partnering. We, we have many conservationists on this call. We just opened an exhibition in partnership with the National Museum of Wildlife Art from Jackson Hole. Um, an absolutely incredible landscape and wildlife exhibition of 86 works. It takes over the, the vast majority of our museum. Um, Tucker Smith is just an incredible painter. So those of you who would be um, interested, please contact us. We'd be happy to, to give you a, a personal tour on that. Valerie Peacock, who is our Clarice and Robert H. Smith educator, she's gonna be following up with everybody with an email um, to make sure that if you want a copy um, of this program this evening and just give you any information if you'd, you'd like to visit us. So again, thank you everybody. It's been wonderful uh, working with the PEC. Good evening and um, happy angling. Tight lines, that's what we say, Elizabeth, tight lines. Tight lines. Tight lines.